Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. Mary Jane Holmes, 18251907, was an American author who wrote popular novels in the mid 19th century. She was born in Massachusetts and spent most of her life in the northeastern United States. Holmes began her writing career as a contributor to various periodicals and newspapers, and she published her first novel, Tempest and Sunshine, in 1854. Over the course of her career, she wrote more than 60 novels, many of which were bestsellers in their day. Holmes' novels were known for their sentimental and moralistic tone, and they often dealt with themes of love, family, and the importance of virtue. Her works were particularly popular among women readers, and they were widely translated and adapted for the stage. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend you both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 1 Spring Bank It was a large, old-fashioned, wooden building with long, winding piazzas and low, square porches where the summer sunshine held many a fantastic dance and where the winter storm piled up its drifts of snow, whistling merrily as it worked and shaking the loosened casement as it went whirling by. In front was a wide-spreading grassy lawn with the carriage road winding through it over the running brook and onward beneath tall forest trees until it reached the main highway, a distance of nearly half a mile. In the rear was a spacious garden with bordered walks, climbing roses and creeping vines showing that somewhere there was a ruling hand which, while neglecting the somber building and suffering it to decay, lavished due care upon the grounds and not on these alone but also on the well-kept barns and the whitewashed dwellings of the Negroes for ours is a Kentucky scene and Springbank a Kentucky home. As we have described it so it was on a drear December night when a fearful storm for that latitude was raging and the snow lay heaped against the fences or sweeping down from the bending trees drifted against the doors and beat against the windows whence a cheerful light was gleaming, telling of life and possible happiness within. There were no flowing curtains before the windows, no drapery sweeping to the floor, nothing save blinds without and simple shades within, neither of which were doing service now, for the master of the house would have it so in spite of his sister's remonstrances. Someone might lose their way on that terrible night, he said and the blaze of the fire on the hearth, which could be seen from afar, would be to them a beacon light to guide them on their way. Nobody would look in upon them as Adeline or Lena as she chose to be called seemed to think there might, and even if they did, why need she care? She was looking well enough, and she'd undone all those little braids which disfigured her so shockingly in the morning, but which, when brushed and carefully arranged, gave her hair that waving appearance she so much desired. As for himself, he never meant to do anything of which he was ashamed, so he did not care how many were watching him through the window and stamping his heavy boots upon the rug, for he had just come in from the storm, Hugh Worthington piled fresh fuel upon the fire and shaking back the mass of short brown curls which had fallen upon his forehead, strode across the room and arranged the shades to his liking, then, Sitting down before the fire, he went off into a reverie, the nature of which his mother, who was watching him, could not guess, and when at last she asked of what he was thinking so intently, he made her no reply. 
He could hardly have told himself, so varied were the thoughts crowding upon his brain that wintry night. Now they were of the eccentric old man from whom he had received Springbank together with the many peculiar ideas which made him the strange, odd creature he was, a mystery to his own sex and a kind of terror to the female portion of the neighborhood who, looking upon him as a woman hater, avoided or coveted his society just as their fancy dictated. For years the old man and the boy had lived alone in that great house, enjoying the freedom from all restraint, the liberty of turning the parlors into kennels if they chose, and converting the upper rooms into a hayloft if they would. No white woman was ever seen upon the premises unless she came as a beggar when some new gown or surplice or organ or chandelier was needed for the pretty little church, lifting its modest spire so unobtrusively among the forest trees not very far from Springbank. John Stanley didn't believe in churches, nor gowns, nor organs, nor women, but he was proverbially liberal and so the fair ones of Glens Creek neighborhood ventured into his den, finding it much pleasanter to do so after the handsome, dark-haired boy came to live with him for about Hugh there was then something very attractive to the little girls, while their mothers pitied him, wondering why he had been permitted to come there, and watching for the change in him, which was sure to ensue. Not all at once did Hugh conform to the customs of his uncle's household, and at first there often came over him a longing for the refinements of his northern home, and a wish to infuse into Chloe, the colored housekeeper, some of his mother's neatness. But a few attempts at reform had taught him how futile was the effort, and Chloe always meeting him with the argument, Taint no use, moss are Hugh. A nigger's a nigger, and I speck e if you're to talk to me till you was hoarse about your Yankee ways of scrubbin' and sweepin' and moppin' with a broom, I shouldn't be an Adam or white folksy than I is now. Besides, Mossar John wouldn't bar no finery. He's only happy when the truck is mighty nigh a foot thick and his things is lying round loose and handy. To a certain extent, this was true, for John Stanley would have felt sadly out of place in any spot where, as Chloe said, his things were not lying round loose and handy, and his habit is everything, so he soon grew accustomed to his surroundings and became as careless of his external appearance as his uncle could desire. Only once had there come to him an awakening, a faint conception of the happiness there might arise from constant association with the pure and refined, such as his uncle had labored to make him believe did not exist. He was thinking of that incident now, and it was not strange that he did not heed his mother when she spoke, for Hugh was far away from Springbank and the storm beating against its walls was to him like the sound of the waves dashing against the vessel's side, just as they did years ago on that night he remembered so well, shuddering as he heard again the murderous hiss of the devouring flames, covering the faded boat with one sheet of fire and driving into the water as a safer friend the shrieking, frightened wretches who but an hour before had been so full of life and hope dancing gaily above the red tongued demon stealthily creeping upward from the hold below where it had taken life. What a fearful scene that was, and the veins grew larger on Hugh's brow while his broad chest heaved with something like a stifled sob as he recalled the little childish form to which he had clung so madly until the cruel timber struck from him all consciousness and he let that form go down neath the treacherous waters of Lake Erie never to come up again alive for so his uncle told him when, weeks after the occurrence, he awoke from the delirious fever which ensued and listened to the sickening detail. Lost, my boy, lost with many others, was what his uncle had said. Lost, there was a world of meaning in that word to Hugh and though it was but a child he lost, yet in the quiet night, when all else around Springbank was locked in sleep, he often lay thinking of her and of what he might perhaps have been had she been spared to him. He had talked with her scarcely an hour in all, 
but even in that time she had made upon him an impression which could never be effaced. He was thinking of her now, and as he thought, visions of a sweet, young face shadowed with curls of golden hair came up before his mind, and he saw again the look of surprise and pain which shone in the soft, blue eyes and illuminated every feature when in answer to some remark of hers he gave vent to the half-infidel principles he had learned from his uncle. Her creed was different from his, and she explained it to him so earnestly that he said to her at last he did, but just to hear what she would say, and though she seemed satisfied he felt there was a shadow between them which was not swept away. Even after he promised to read the Bible she timidly offered him and which he had accepted wondering at her interest in one whose name she did not even know. Hers was written on the flyleaf of the little book which he had yet hidden away where no curious eye could find it, while carefully folded between its leaves was a curl of golden hair. That tress and the Bible which enclosed it had made Hugh Worthington a better man. He did not often read the Bible, it is true, and his acquaintances were frequently startled with opinions which had so pained the little girl on board the St. Helena, but this was merely on the surface, for far below the rough exterior there was a world of goodness, a mine of gems kept bright by memories of the angel child who flitted for so brief a span across his pathway and then was lost forever. He had tried so hard to save her, had clasped her so fondly to his bosom when with extended arms she came to him for aid. He could save her, he said, he could swim to the shore with perfect ease, and so without a moment's hesitation she had leaped with him into the surging waves, and that was about the last he could remember, save that he clutched frantically at the long, golden hair streaming above the water retaining in his grasp the lock which no one at Springbank had ever seen, for this one romance of Hugh's life was a secret with himself. No one save his uncle had witnessed his emotions when told that she was dead, no one else had seen his bitter tears or heard the vehement exclamation, you've tried to teach me there was no hereafter, no heaven for such as she, but I know better now, and I am glad there is, for she is safe forever. These were not idle words, and the belief then expressed became with Hugh Worthington a fixed principle, which his skeptical uncle tried in vain to eradicate. There was a heaven, and she was there, comprised nearly the whole of Hugh's religious creed, if we accept a vague, misty hope that he, too, would someday find her, how or by what means he never seriously inquired, only this he knew, it would be through her influence which even now followed him everywhere, producing its good effects. It had checked him many and many a time when his fierce temper was in the ascendant, forcing back the harsh words he would otherwise have spoken and making him as gentle as a child, and when the temptations to which young men of his age are exposed were spread out alluringly before him, a single thought of her was sufficient to lead him from the forbidden ground. Every incident connected with his brief acquaintance with golden hair seemed to be recalled to his mind this wintry night, and so absorbed was he in his reverie that, until twice repeated, he did not hear his mother's anxious inquiry. What is that noise? It sounds like someone in distress. Hugh started at last, and after listening for a moment he, too, caught the sound which had alarmed his mother and made Lena stop her reading. A moaning cry, as if for help, mingled with an infant's wail, now here, now there it seemed to be, just as the fierce north wind shifted its course and drove first at the window of the sitting room and then at the ponderous doors of the gloomy hall. It is someone in the storm, Hugh said, going to the window and peering out into the darkness. Elwide's child most likely. Negro young ones are always squalling, and I heard her tell Aunt Chloe at supper time that Tommy had the colic, Lena remarked, opening again the book she was reading, and with a slight shiver drawing nearer to the fire. Where are you going, my son? asked Mrs. Worthington as Hugh arose to leave the room. Going to L.Y.D.'s cabin, 
For if Tommy is sick enough to make his screams heard above the storm, she may need some help, was Hugh's reply, and a moment after he was plowing his way through the drifts which lay between the house and the negro quarters. How kind and thoughtful he is, the mother said, more to herself than to her daughter, who nevertheless quickly rejoined. Yes, kind to niggers, and horses, and dogs, I'll admit, but let me, or any other white woman come before him as an object of pity, and the tables are turned at once. I wonder what does make him hate women so. I don't believe he does, Mrs. Worthington replied. His uncle, you know, was very unfortunate in his marriage and had a way of judging all our sex by his wife. Living with him as long as Hugh did, it's natural he should imbibe a few of his ideas. A few, Lena repeated, better say all, for John Stanley and Hugh Worthington are as near alike as an old and young Manuel could be. What an old codger he was, and how like a savage he lived here. I never shall forget how the house looked the day we came, or how satisfied Hugh seemed when he met us at the gate and said everything was in splendid order, and closing her book, the young lady laughed merrily as she recalled the time when she first crossed her brother's threshold, stepping, as she affirmed, over half a dozen dogs and as many squirming kittens, catching her foot in some fishing tackle, finding tobacco in the china closet and seekers in the knife box where they had been put to get them out of the way. But he really did his best for us, mildly interposed the mother. Don't you remember what the servants said about his cleaning one floor himself because he knew they were tired? Did it more to save the lazy negro steps than from any regard for our comfort, retorted Lena. At all events, he's been mighty careful since how he gratified my wishes. Sometimes I believe he perfectly hates me and wishes I'd never been born and tears which arose from anger rather than any wounded sisterly feeling glittered in Lena's black eyes. Hugh does not hate anyone, said Mrs. Worthington, much less his sister, though you must admit that you try him terribly. How? I'd like to know. Lena asked, and her mother replied. He thinks you proud and vain and artificial, and you know he abhors deceit above all else. Why he cut off his right hand sooner than tell a lie. Shaw was Lena's contemptuous response, then after a moment, she continued, I wonder how we came to be so different. He must be like his father, and I like mine, that is, supposing I know who he is. Wouldn't it be funny if, just to be hateful, he had sent you back the wrong child? What made you think of that? Mrs. Worthington asked, quickly, and Lena replied. Oh, nothing, only the last time Hugh had one of his tantrums and got so outrageously angry at me, he said he'd give all he owned if it were so, but I reckon he'll never have his wish. There's too much of old Sam about me to admit of a doubt, and laughing spitefully, Lena returned to her book just as Hugh re-entered the room. Have you heard that sound again? He asked. It wasn't Tommy, for I found him asleep and I've been all around the house but could discover nothing. The storm is beginning to abate, I think, and the moon is trying to break through the clouds and going again to the window, Hugh looked out into the yard where the shrubbery and trees were just discernible in the grayish light of the December moon. That's a big drift by the lower gate, he continued and queer-shaped, too. Come see, mother. Isn't that a shawl or an apron? or something blowing in the wind? Mrs. Worthington arose and joining her son looked in the direction indicated where a garment of some kind was certainly fluttering in the gale. It's something from the wash, I guess, 
she said. I thought all the time Hannah had better not hang out the clothes as some of them were sure to be lost. This explanation was quite satisfactory to Mrs. Worthington, but that strange drift by the gate troubled Hugh and the signal above it seemed to him like a signal of distress. Why should the snow drift there more than elsewhere? He never knew it do so before. He had half a mind to turn out the dogs and see what that would do. Rover, he called suddenly as he advanced to the rear room where, among his other pets, was a huge Newfoundland of great sagacity. Rover, Rover, I want you. In an instant, the whole pack were upon him, jumping and fawning and licking the hands which had never dealt them out save kindness. It was only Rover, however, who was this time needed, and leading him to the door, Hugh pointed toward the gate and bade him see what was there. Snuffing slightly at the storm which was not over yet, Rover started down the walk while Hugh stood waiting in the door. At first Rover's steps were slow and uncertain, but as he advanced they increased in rapidity until, with a sudden bound and a cry, such as dogs are wont to give when they have caught their destined prey, he sprang upon the mysterious ridge and commenced digging it down with his paws. Easy, Rover, be careful, Hugh called from the door and instantly the half-savage growl which the wind had brought to his ear was changed into a piteous cry as if the faithful creature were answering back that other help than his was needed there. Rover had found something in that pile of snow. Chapter 2 What Rover Found Unmindful of the sleet beating upon his uncovered head, Hugh hastened to the spot where the noble brute was licking a baby face which he had ferried it out from beneath the shawl wrapped so carefully around it to shield it from the cold for instead of one there were two in that drift of snow, a mother and her child. Dead the former seemed, for the white cheek which Hugh touched was cold as stone and with a sickening feeling the young man leaned against the gatepost and tried to assure himself that what he saw was a mere fancy of the brain. But it was terribly real. That stiffened form lying there so still hugging that sleeping child so closely to its bosom was no delusion and his mother's voice, calling to know what he was doing, brought Hugh back at last to a consciousness that he must act immediately. Mother, he screamed, send a servant here, quick, or let Ed come herself. There's a woman dead, I fear. I can carry her well enough, but Ed must come for the child. The what? gasped Mrs. Worthington, who, terrified beyond measure at the mention of a dead woman, was doubly so at hearing of a child. A child, she repeated, whose child, while Lena, shrinking back from the keen blast, refused to obey, and so the mother, throwing her cloak around her, joined the group by the gate. Carefully, Hugh lifted the light figure in his arms and bore it to the house where Lena, whose curiosity had overcome her selfishness, met him on the piazza and led the way to the sitting room, asking innumerable questions as to how he found her and who she was. Hugh made no reply save an order that the lounge should be brought near the fire and a pillow from his mother's bed. For mine, then, he added, as he saw the anxious look in his mother's face and guessed that she shrank from having her own snowy pillow come in contact with the wet, limpid figure he was depositing upon the lounge. It was a slight, girlish form and the long brown hair, loosened from its confinement, fell in rich profusion over the pillow which Lena brought half reluctantly, eyeing askance the insensible object before her and daintily holding back her dress lest it should come in contact with the child her mother had deposited upon the floor where it lay crying lustily, unnoticed save by Rover, who, quite as awkward as his master would have been in like circumstances, seemed trying to amuse and protect. It, 
interposing his shaggy proportions between that and the fire when once it showed a disposition to creep that way. Do one of you do something, Hugh said, as he saw how indisposed both his mother and sister were to help, the former being too much frightened and the latter too indignant to act. The idea of a strange woman being thrust upon them in this way was highly displeasing to Miss Lena, who haughtily drew back from the little one when it stretched its arms out toward her, while its pretty lip quivered and the tears dropped over its rounded cheek. To her it was nothing but an intruder, a brat, and so she steeled her heart against its touching appeal and turned her back upon it, leaving for Rover the kindly office of soothing the infant. Meantime Hugh, with all a woman's tenderness, had done for the now reviving stranger what he could, and as his mother began to collect her scattered senses and evince some interest in the matter, he withdrew to call the Negroes, judging it prudent to remain away a while, as his presence might be an intrusion. From the first, he had felt sure that the individual thrown upon his charity was not a low, vulgar person, as his sister seemed to think. He had not yet seen her face distinctly, for it lay in the shadow, but the long, flowing hair, the delicate hands, the white neck, of which he had caught a glimpse as his mother unfastened the stiffened dress, all these had made an impression, and involuntarily repeating to himself, poor girl, he strode a second time across the drifts which lay in his backyard and was soon pounding at old Chloe's cabin door bidding her and Hannah dress at once and come immediately to the house. They will need hot water most likely, he thought, and returning to the kitchen he built the fire himself and then sat down to wait until such time as it was proper for him to appear again in the sitting room where a strange scene was enacting. The change of atmosphere and the restoratives applied had done their work and Mrs. Worthington saw that the long eyelashes began to tremble while a faint color stole into the hitherto colorless cheeks and at last the large, brown eyes unclosed and looked into hers with an expression so mournful that a thrill of yearning tenderness for the desolate young creature shot through her heart and bending down she said, kindly, are you better now? Yes, thank you. Where is Willie? was the low response the tone of the voice thrilling Mrs. Worthington with an undefinable emotion. Even Lena started, it was so low, so sweet, so musical, and coming near she answered, if it's the baby you mean, he is here, playing with our dog, Rover. There was a look of gratitude in the brown eyes, while the white lips moved slowly, and Mrs. Worthington caught the whispered words of thanksgiving that baby Willie was safe. Where am I? She said next, and is he here? Is this his house? Whose house? Mrs. Worthington asked. Whom are you looking for? The girl did not answer at once, and when she did her mind seemed wandering. I waited so long, she said, and watched from morning till dark, but he never came again only the letter which broke my heart. Willie was a wee baby then, and I almost hated him for a while, but he wasn't to blame. I wasn't to blame. Our father in heaven knew I wasn't, and after I went to him and told him all about it, and asked him to care for Ada, the first terrible pain was over and love for Willie came back with a hope that the letter might be false. I'm glad God gave me Willie now, even if he did take his father from me. Mrs. Worthington and her daughter exchanged curious glances of wonder, and the latter abruptly asked, Where is Willie's father? I don't know, came in a wailing sob from the depths of the pillow where the face for a moment hid itself from view. Where did you come from was the next question put in a tone so cold and harsh that the young girl looked up in some alarm and answered meekly. From New York, ma'am. It's a great ways off, and I thought I'd never get here, but everybody was so kind to me and Willie, and the driver said if twant so late, 
and he's so many passengers he drive across the fields. He pointed out the way and I came on alone. I saw the light off on the hill and tried to hurry, but the snow blinded me so bad and Willie was so heavy that I fell down by the gate and guess I went to sleep, for I remember dreaming that the angels were watching over me and covering Willie with the snow to keep him warm. The color had faded now from Mrs. Worthington's face for a terrible suspicion of she scarcely knew what had darted across her mind and very timidly she asked again, Whom did you hope to find? Mr. Worthington. Does he live here? Was the frank reply whereupon Lena, with crimsoning cheek, drew herself up haughtily, exclaiming, I knew it. I've thought so ever since Hugh came home from New York. In her joy at having, as she supposed, found something tangible against her provoking brother, some weapon with which to ward off his offensive attacks upon her own deceit and want of truth, Lena forgot that she had never seen much of him until several months after his return from New York, at which time she had become, from necessity, a member of his household and dependent upon his bounty. Lena was unreasonable and without stopping to consider the effect her remarks would have upon the young girl, she was about to commence a tirade of abuse when the mother interposed and with an air of greater authority than she generally assumed toward her imperious daughter, bade her keep silence while she questioned the stranger, gazing wonderingly from one to the other as if uncertain what they meant. Mrs. Worthington had no such feelings for the girl as Lena entertained. If she were anything to Hugh, and the circumstances thus far favored that belief, then she was something to Hugh's mother, and the kind heart of the matron went out toward her even more strongly than it had done at first. It will be easier to talk with you, she said leaning forward, if I knew what to call you. Ada was the response, and the brown eyes, swimming with tears, sought the face of the questioner with a wistful eagerness. Ada, you say. Well, then, Ada, why have you come to my son on such a night as this, and what is he to you? Are you his mother? And Ada started up. I did not know he had one. Oh, I'm so glad. And you'll be kind to me, who never had a mother. A person who never had a mother was an anomaly to Mrs. Worthington, whose powers of comprehension were not the clearest imaginable. Never had a mother, she repeated. How can that be? A smile flitted for a moment across Otta's pale face, and then she answered. I never knew a mother's care, I mean. There is some mystery which I could not fathom, only sometimes there comes up visions of a cottage with water near, and there's a lady there with voice and eyes like yours, and somebody is teaching me to walk, somebody who calls me little sister, though I've never seen him since. Then there is confusion, a rolling of wheels, and a hum of some great city, and that's all I know of mother. But your father? What do you know of him? said Mrs. Worthington, and instantly a shadow stole into the sweet young face as Otta replied, nothing definite. And Hugh? Where did you meet him? And what is he to you? The only friend I've got in the wide world. May I see him, please? First tell what he is to you and to this child, Lena rejoined, her black eyes flashing with a gleam, before which the brown eyes for an instant quailed, then as if something of a like spirit were called to life in her bosom, Ada answered calmly, Your brother might not like me to tell. I must see him first, see him alone. One thing more, and Lena held back her mother who was starting in quest of Hugh. Are you a wife? Don't, Lena, Mrs. Worthington whispered, 
as she saw the look of agony pass over Ada's face. Don't worry her so, deal kindly by the fallen. I am not fallen, came passionately from the quivering lips. I'm as true a woman as either of you, look, and she pointed to the golden band encircling the third finger. Lena was satisfied and needed no further explanations. To her, it was plain as daylight. Two years before Hugh had gone to New York on business connected with his late uncle's affairs and in an unguarded moment had married some poor girl whose pretty face had pleased his fancy. Tiring of her, as of course he would, he had deserted her, keeping his marriage a secret and she had followed him to Springbank. These were the facts as Lena read them and though she despised her brother for it, she was more than half glad. Hugh could never taunt her again with double dealing, for wouldn't she pay him back if he did, with his neglected, disowned wife and child? She knew they were his, and it was a resemblance to Hugh, which she had noticed from the first in Willie's face. How glad Lena was to have this hold upon her brother, and how eagerly she went in quest of him, keeping back old Chloe and Hannah until she had witnessed his humiliation. Somewhat impatient of the long delay, Hugh sat in the dingy kitchen, watching the tallow candle spluttering in its iron socket and wondering who it was he had rescued from the snow when Lena appeared and with an air of injured dignity bade him follow her. What's up now that Ed looks so solemn like was Hugh's mental comment as he took his way to the room where In a half-reclining position, Ada lay, her large, bright eyes fixed eagerly upon the door through which he entered, and a bright flush upon her cheek called up by the suspicions to which she had been subjected. Perhaps they might be true. She did not know. Nobody knew or could tell her unless it were Hugh, and she waited for him so anxiously, starting when she heard a manly step and knew that he was coming. For an instant, she scanned his face curiously to assure herself that it was he, then with an imploring cry as if for him to save her from some dreaded evil she stretched her little hands toward him and sobbed, Mr. Worthington, was it true? Was it a real thing, or only sheer mockery, as his letter said? George, George Hastings, you know. And shedding back from her white face the wealth of flowing hair, Otto waited for the answer, which did not come at once. In utter amazement, Hugh gazed upon the stranger, and then, with an interjection of astonishment, exclaimed, Otto, Otto Hastings, why are you here? In the tone of his voice, surprise was mingled with disapprobation, the latter of which Otto detected at once and as if it had crushed out the last lingering hope, she covered her face with her hands and sobbed piteously. Don't you turn against me, or I'll surely die, and I've come so far to find you. By this time, Hugh was himself again. His rapid, quick-seeing mind had taken in both the past and the present, and turning to his mother and sister, he said, Leave us alone for a time. I will call you when you are needed and, at, remember, no listening by the door, he continued, as he saw how disappointed Lena seemed. Rather reluctantly, Mrs. Worthington and her daughter left the room, and Hugh was alone with Ada, whose face was still hidden in her hands and whose body shook with strong emotion. Deliberately turning the key in the lock, Hugh advanced to her side, and kneeling by the couch, said, Kindly, I am more pained to see you here than I can well express. Why did you come, and where is? The name was lost to Lena, listening outside, in spite of her brother's injunction. Neither could she understand the passionate, inaudible response. She only knew that sobs and tears were mingled with it, that there was a rustling of paper, which Otto bade Hugh read, asking if it were true. This was all Lena could hear, 
and muttering to herself, it does not sound much like man and wife, she rather unwillingly quitted her position and Hugh was really alone with Ada. Never was Hugh in so awkward a position before or so uncertain how to act. The sight of that sobbing, trembling, wretched creature had perfectly unmanned him, making him almost as much a woman as herself. Sitting down by her side, he laid her poor aching head upon his own broad bosom and pushing back her long, bright hair, tried to soothe her into quiet while he candidly confessed that he feared the letter was true. It had occurred to him at the time, he said, that all was not right, but he had no suspicion that it could be so bad as it now seemed or he would have felt to the floor every participant in the cruel farce which had so darkened Ada's life. It was a dastardly act, he said, pressing closer to him the light form quivering with anguish. He knew how innocent she was, and he held her in his arms as he would once have held the golden haired had she come to him with a tale of woe. Let me see that letter again, he said, and taking the rumpled sheet, stained with Ada's tears, he turned it to the light and read once more the cruel lines in which there was still much of love and pity for the poor helpless thing to whom they were addressed. You will surely find friends who will care for you until the time when I may come to really make you mine. He repeated these words twice, aloud, his lip curling with contempt for the man who could so coolly thrust upon others a charge which should have been so sacred, and his heart, throbbing with the noble resolve, that the confidence she had placed in him by coming there should not be abused for he would be true to the trust and care for poor, little, half-crazed Ada moaning so piteously beside him and as he read the last line, saying eagerly, he speaks of coming back. Do you think he ever will? Or could I find him if I should try? I thought of starting once but it was so far, and there was Willie. Oh, if he could see Willie. Mr. Worthington, do you believe he loves me one bit, and in the eyes there was a look as if the poor creature were famishing for the love whose existence she was questioning. Hugh did not understand the nature of a love which could so deliberately abandon one like Ada. It was not such love as he had cherished for the golden-haired, but men were not alike, and so he said, at last, that the letter contained many assurances of affection and pleadings for forgiveness for the great wrong committed. It seems family pride has something to do with it. I wonder where his people live, or who they are. Did he never tell you? No and Ada shook her head mournfully. There was something strange about it. He never gave me the slightest clue. He only told how proud they were and how they would spurn a poor girl like me and said we must keep it a secret until he had won them over. If I could only find them, would you go to them? Hugh asked quickly and Ada answered. Sometimes I've thought I would. I'd brave his proud mother, I'd lay Willie in her lap. I'd tell her whose he was, and then I'd go away and die. They could not harm my Willie, and the young girl mother glanced proudly at her sleeping boy. Then, after a pause, she continued, Once, Mr. Worthington, when my brain was all on fire, I went down to the river, and said I'd end my wretched life, but God, who was watching me, held me back. He cooled my scorching head, he eased the pain, and on the very spot where I meant to jump, I kneeled down and said, Our Father. No other words would come, only these, lead us not into temptation. Wasn't it kind in God to save me? There was a radiant expression in the sweet face as Ada said this, but it quickly passed away and was succeeded by one of deep concern when Hugh abruptly asked, Do you believe in God? 
Oh, Mr. Worthington. Don't you? You do, you must, you will, and Ada shrank away from him as from a monster. The action reminded him of the golden haired when on the deck of the St. Helena he had asked her a similar question and anxious further to probe the opinion of the girl beside him, he continued. If, as you think, there is a god who knew and saw when you were about to drown yourself, why didn't he prevent the cruel wrong to you? Why did he suffer it? What he does we know not now, but we shall know hereafter, Ada said, reverently, adding, if George had feared God, he would not have left me so, but he didn't, and perhaps he says there is no God, but you don't, Mr. Worthington. Your face don't look like it. Tell me you believe, and in her eagerness Ada grasped his arm beseechingly. Yes, Ada, I believe, Hugh answered, half jestingly, but it's such as you that make me believe, and as persons of your creed think everything is ordered for good, so possibly you were permitted to suffer that you might come here and benefit me. I think I must keep you until he is found. No, no, and the tears flowed at once, I cannot be a burthen to you. I have no claim. Why then did you come at all? Hugh asked, and Ada answered. For a time after I received the letter, everything was so dark that I didn't realize and couldn't think of anything. But when the landlady hinted those terrible things and finally told me I must leave to give place to a respectable woman, that's just what she said, a respectable woman with a child who knew its own father, then I woke up and tried to think of something, but the more I tried, the more I couldn't, till at last I prayed so hard one night that God would tell me what to do, and suddenly I remembered you and your good, kind, honest face, just as it looked when you spoke to me after it was over, and called me by the new name. Oh, dear, oh, dear, and gasping for breath, Ada leaned against Hugh's arm, sobbing bitterly. After a moment she grew calm again and continued. I wrote down your name and where you lived, though why I did not know, and I forgot where I put it, but as if God really were helping me, I found it in my old portfolio, and something bade me come, for you perhaps would know if it was true. It was some time before I could fully decide to come, and in that time I hardly know how I lived or where. George left me money and sent more, but it's most gone now but I must not stay. I can take care of myself. What can you do? Hugh asked and Otta replied sadly. I don't know, but God will find me something. I never worked much, but I can learn and I can already sew neatly too. Besides that, a few days before I decided to come here, I advertised in the Herald for some place as governess or lady's waiting maid. Perhaps I'll hear from that. It's hardly possible. Such advertisements are thick as blackberries, Hugh said, and then in a few brief words, he marked out Otta's future course. George Hastings might or might not return to claim her, and whether he did or didn't, she must live meantime and we're so well as at Spring Bank. I do not like women much, he said, but something makes me like you, pity, I reckon, and I'm going to take care of you until that scoundrel turns up, then, if you say so, I'll surrender you to his care, or better yet, I'll shoot him and keep you to myself. Not as a sweetheart, or anything of that kind, he hastened to add, as he saw the flush on Otta's cheek. Hugh Worthington has nothing to do with that species of the animal kingdom, but as my sister Ada, and as Hugh repeated that name, there arose in his great heart an undefinable wish that the gentle girl beside him had been his sister instead of the high-tempered Adeline 
who never tried to conciliate or understand him and whom Hugh could not love as brothers should love sisters. He knew how impatiently she was waiting now to know the result of that interview and just how much opposition he should meet when he announced his intention of keeping Ada. But Hugh was master of Springbank, his will was all powerful and not an entire world could move him when once he was determined. Still contention was not agreeable and he oftentimes yielded a point rather than dispute. But this time he was firm. Without any intention of wronging Ada, he still felt as if in some way he had been instrumental to her ruin and now when she came to him for help, he would not cast her off though the keeping her would subject him to a multitude of unpleasant remarks, surmises and suspicions from the people of Glens Creek to say nothing of his mother's and Lena's displeasure. Added to this was another objection, a serious one, which most men would have weighed carefully before deciding to burden themselves with two additional individuals. Though the owner of Springbank, he was far from being rich and many were the shifts and self-denials he was obliged to make to meet the increased expense entailed upon him by his mother and sister. John Stanley had been accounted wealthy, but at his death there was nothing left save a few acres of nearly worn-out land, the old dilapidated house, and a dozen or more negroes. With good management, this was amply sufficient to supply Hugh's limited wants and he was looking forward to a life of careless ease when his mother from New England wrote, asking for a home. Hugh did not know then, as well as he did now, what it would cost to keep a young lady of his sister's habits. He only knew that his home was far different from the New England one he remembered so well, but such as it was he would share it with his mother and sister, and so he had bidden them welcome concealing from them as far as possible the trouble he oftentimes had to meet the increased demand for money which their presence brought. This to a certain extent was the secret of his patched boots, his threadbare coat and coarse pants with which Lena so often taunted him saying he wore them just to be stingy and mortify her when in fact necessity rather than choice was the cause of his shabby appearance. He had never told her so however, never said that the unfashionable coat so offensive to her fastidious vision was worn that she might be the better clothed and fed. Yet such was the case, and now he was deliberately adding to his already heavy burden. But Hugh was capable of great self-sacrifices. He could manage somehow, and Ada should stay. He would say that she was a friend whom he had known in New York that her husband had deserted her and in her distress she had come to him for aid, for the rest he trusted that time and her own appearance would wear away any unpleasant impressions which her presence might create. All this he explained to Ada, who assented tacitly thinking within herself that she should not long remain at Springbank, a dependent upon one on whom she had no claim. She was too weak now, however, to oppose him and merely nodding to his suggestions lay her head upon the arm of the lounge with a low cry that she was sick and warm. Stepping to the door, Hugh turned the key and summoning the group waiting anxiously in the adjoining room bade them come at once as Mrs. Hastings appeared to be fainting. Great emphasis he laid upon the missus and catching it up at once Lena repeated, Mrs. Hastings. So am I just as much. Add, and the eyes which shone so softly on poor Ada flashed with gleams of fire as Hugh said to his sister, not another word against that girl if you wish to remain here longer. She has been unfortunate. I guessed as much, sneeringly interrupted Lena. Silence and Hugh's foot came down as it sometimes did when chiding a refractory negro. She is as true, yes, truer than you. He who should have protected her has basely deserted her. And I shall care for her. See that a fire is kindled in the west chamber 
and go up yourself when it is made and see that all is comfortable. Do you understand? And he gazed sternly at Lena, who was too much astonished to answer even if she had been so disposed. That Hugh should take in a beggar from the streets was bad enough, but to keep her, and worse yet to put her in the best chamber where ex-governor Russ had slept and where was nailed down the carpet brought from New England was preposterous and Hugh was certainly crazy. But never was man more sane than Hugh, and seeing her apparently incapable of carrying out his orders he himself sent Hannah to build the fire, bidding her, with all a woman's forethought, be careful that the bed was aired and clothes enough put on. Take a blanket from my bed, if necessary, he added, as Hannah, bewildered with the carryings on, disappeared up the staircase, a long line of smoke streaming behind her. When all was ready, Hugh went for Ada, and taking her in his arms carried her to the upper chamber, where the fire was burning brightly, casting cheerful shadows upon the wall, and making Ada smile gratefully as she looked up in his face and murmured, God bless you, Mr. Worthington. Ada will pray for you tonight when she is alone. It's all that she can do. They laid her upon the bed. Hugh himself arranging her pillows, which no one else appeared inclined to touch. Family opinion was against her, innocent and beautiful as she looked lying there, so helpless, so still, with her long fringed lashes shading her colorless cheek and her little hands folded upon her bosom as if already she were breathing the promised prayer for Hugh. Only in Mrs. Worthington's heart was there a chord of sympathy. She couldn't help feeling for the desolate stranger and when, at her own request, Hannah placed Willie in her lap, ere laying him by his mother, she gave him an involuntary hug and touched her lips to his fat, round cheek. It was the first kiss given him at Springbank, and it was meet that it should come from her. He looks as you did, Hugh, when you were a baby, she said, while Chloe rejoined. The very spawn of Mars, Hugh, now. I tacted it to fust minute. Can't she dis chilly, and, with a chuckle which she meant to be very expressive, the fat old woman waddled from the room followed by Hannah, who was to sleep there that night, and who must first return to her cabin to make the necessary preparations for her vigils. Hugh and his mother were alone, and turning to her son, Mrs. Worthington said, gently, This is sad business, Hugh, worse than you imagine. Do you know how folks will talk? Let them talk, Hugh growled. It cannot be much worse than it is now. Nobody cares for Hugh Worthington, and why should they, when his own mother and sister are against him, in actions if not in words, one sighing when his name is mentioned, as if he really were the most provoking son that ever was born, and the other openly berating him as a monster, a clown, a savage, a scarecrow, and all that. I tell you, mother there is but little to encourage me in the kind of life I'm leading. Neither you nor Ad have tried to make anything of me or have done me any good, but somehow I feel as if she would, and he pointed to the now sleeping Ada. At all events, I know it's right to keep her, and I want you to help me, will you? That is, will you be kind to her, and when folks speak against her, as they may, Will you stand for her as for your own daughter? She's more like you than Ad, and Hugh gazed wonderingly from one to the other, struck, for the first time, with a resemblance, fancied or real, between the two. Mrs. Worthington did not heed this last, so intent was she on the first of Hugh's remarks. Choking with tears, she said, You wrong me, Hugh. I do try to make something of you. You are a dear child to me, dearer than the other, but I'm a weak woman and Lena sways me at will. 
A kind word unmanned Hugh at once, and kneeling by his mother, he put his arms around her and begging forgiveness for his harsh words, asked again a mother's care for Ada. Hugh, and Mrs. Worthington looked him steadily in the face, is Ada your wife or Willie your child? Great guns, mother, and Hugh started to his feet as quick as if a bombshell had exploded at his side. No, by all that's sacred, no. Upon my word, you look sorry instead of glad. Are you sorry, mother, to find me better than you imagined it possible for a bad boy like me to be? No, Hugh, not sorry. I was only thinking that I've sometimes fancied that, as a married man, you might be happier, and when this woman came so strangely, and you seemed so interested, I didn't know, I rather thought. I know, and Hugh interrupted her. You thought maybe, I raised Ned when I was in New York, and, as a proof of said resurrection, Mrs. Ned and Ned Jr. had come with their baggage. But it is not so, she does not belong to me, and going up to his mother he told her all he knew of Ada, adding, now will you be kind to her for my sake? And when Ad rides her highest horse, as she is sure to do, will you smooth her down? Tell her Ada has as good right here as she, if I choose to keep her. There was a faint remonstrance on Mrs. Worthington's part, her argument being based upon what folks would say, and Hugh's inability to take care of many more. Hugh did not care a picayune for folks, and as for Ada, if his mother did not wish her there, and he presumed she did not, he'd get her boarded for the present with Aunt Eunice, who, like himself, was invincible to public opinion, she needed just such a companion. She'd be a mother to Ada, and Ada a daughter to her, so they needn't spend further time in talking, for he was getting tired. Mrs. Worthington was much more easily won over to Hugh's opinion than Lena, who, when told of the arrangement, raised a perfect hurricane of expostulations and tears. They'd be a county talk, she said, nobody would come near them, and she might as well enter a nunnery at once. Besides, hadn't Hugh enough on his hands already without taking more? If my considerate sister really thinks so, hadn't she better try and help herself a little?" retorted Hugh in a blaze of anger. I've only paid $250 for her since she came here, to say nothing of that bill at Harney's due in January. Lena began to cry, and Hugh, repenting of his harsh speech as soon as it was uttered, but far too proud to take it back, strode up and down the room, chafing like a young lion. Come children, it's after midnight, let us adjourn until tomorrow, Mrs. Worthington said, by way of ending the painful interview, at the same time handing a candle to Hugh, who took it silently and withdrew, banging the door behind him with a force which made Lena start and burst into a fresh flood of tears. I'm a brute, a savage, was Hugh's not very self-complimentary soliloquy as he went up the stairs. What did I want to twit at for? What good did it do, only to make her mad and bother mother? I wish I could do better, but I can't. Confound my badness, and having by this time reached his own door, Hugh entered his room, and drawing a chair to the fire always kindled for him at night, sat down to think.